Hello, good morning. From FreeMind Project, we are here today with Saint Jean Pierre Garnier Mallet, the father of the theory of the doubling of time. Good morning, Jean Pierre. How would you describe the workshop that you have come to teach this weekend in Barcelona? It's complex to describe, meaning to try to teach people that do not have a scientific background the applications of a scientific theory and make it accessible to everyone with its underlying scientific logic. Well, this is the main interest of these trainings, to demonstrate the applications of a scientific theory that allows everyone to find balance within themselves without knowing anything about equations. This is the goal. So, how would you describe your theory to someone who does not understand the scientific language? It is a simple matter of explaining why there is a doubling of time, which means that I have available two different times simultaneously, a very short time in which I have no time to do anything, a zero time that I'm not aware of, and that simultaneously I can have a different time that is excessively long during that short time. Herein lies the difficulty in understanding. In the short time, I don't have time to do anything. And in the very long time, I have time to do many things. Which means that if I'm present in the two different times, I can do many things. And yet, in my time, I have no time to know that I'm doing many things. So I don't have the sensation that I'm doing many things. Because for me, that time does not exist. So how is that possible, would you say, to think that there is a time in which I'm not aware of it, but not perceiving that time, I have the sensation that it doesn't exist, and yet, the fact that it exists is, means that I have the time to do many, many things which change my memory in an instantaneous way. And it brings me desires, new thoughts that seem to come out of nowhere. And this is the way in which a scientific theory allows finally to explain the instinct the intuition, to explain anticipation, to explain premonitions, all those things that are very mysterious. Many things have been invented to explain the mysterious, and it is yet very simple. In order to live, you have to be able to anticipate everything that is to come. A particle does the same thing, and this is something that we already know. You take two doubled particles, and while one of them does many things, the other one does nothing. And the one that does many things alters the memory of the one that does nothing. And there is an exchange of information that is instantaneous between those particles that exist in two different times. Those particles that exist in two different times are going to experience the most classic things and they're going to be able to see when and how each one of them acts upon the other. The most important example is the black hole, because the particle that arrives at the edge of a black hole doubles itself, and one of them enters the black hole and instantaneously disappears. The particularity of a black hole is that if someone enters into it, it instantaneously disappears. If I am the observer that is within the black hole, what I see is that the one that is trying to enter has a hard time trying to do so, which means that on one side he is instantaneously disintegrated in the black hole, while from the other side it takes a hard work to actually do so. So we see perfectly that there are two different times, and that relativity of time, what good is it for? The particle that disappears into the black hole takes all of its time in order to realize many experiences, makes many new things that enrich its memory. But the other one that is at the edge of the black hole keeps its memory intact, which means that the particle that comes out of the black hole again in the same rapid way in which it entered 
We don't have the sensation that it is coming out. We have the sensation that it is a new particle that is there at the edge of the black hole and that makes a union with its other particle. In fact, it is the doubled particle that re-encounters itself with its celibate particle, that comes to unite with the celibate particle that it was before. There is, though, an exchange of memory instantaneously for the particle that remained at the edge. It did not make any new experience, but by the particle that is in the black hole can change its memory simply through an exchange of information. You see then that this principle is something that is totally known scientifically. We don't know and we don't see what use it can have for us, which is very surprising. And yet, that's what the particles do. And we that are nothing but a set of particles do not take advantage of this. Now, why, why should it be any different? And it is here that we need to understand the following thing. We have been told too many times that we are here to serve science which means that we're discovering things, that science is something we try to understand, which is not true. We are the science, and everything is at our service, absolutely all the laws at our service, and not the other way around. And we have been made to believe that it is us that are here to serve the science, which means that this is something that we need to take advantage of and we need to know how we can do that. Obviously not through scientific equations. We are not on Earth to make equations. We are on Earth to have a good life, which means that perhaps the most important thing we are here to do is to find out the meaning of everything. The theory of the doubling of time enables us to understand why we're here on Earth, as simple as that. That's why you have to be careful with those that speak about the theory of the doubling of time, saying it is a technique when it is not a technique, it's a vital principle. And to turn this principle into a technique is to minimize it and pull people towards tremendous mistake. You have to explain people that a vital principle does not need any technique and that those who search for a technique simply get lost in the way. We need to understand the scientific logic that is behind the vital principle in order to be able to use it in a way in which it can bring balance into our lives. This is what is important. I think I have answered your question. So we can create our reality through a potential future that has already been lived by our double? The notion of double is something different. Obviously, if we live in two different times, we can call that a double. It means I exist in a certain time and I also exist in a different time. Obviously, the most simple would be to say that we have a double and that those exchanges of information that happen through a double. But we need to know that it is not something that is artificial, but it is something that is totally natural. The particles that I was mentioning earlier that exchange information when they double themselves, produce a phenomena called intricacy. It's a phenomena that is totally being verified scientifically. At the level of particles, this phenomena is not very well understood why this phenomena of exchange of information happens, because this theory of the doubling of time is not known, nor is it known why there is a need for such a doubling of time. To understand the doubling of time, we need to take the very basis of logic. If I ask myself a question, obviously I want to have an answer as quickly as possible. And the time that I dedicate to find the answer to my question is for me a time that is wasted. From this moment, the idea of the doubling is very simple. I'm going to suppress the time that exists between my question and my answer. And I'm going to receive the answer at the same time that I formulate my question, which will enable me to ask myself other questions. You need to imagine that there is someone that answers my question, and it is here where I double myself putting someone that is like me, that is going in a time that I suppress, that is going to answer my question. This doubling is very simple and easy to understand. One of them takes the time necessary to answer the question, while the other waits for the answer at the same time that the question is formulated. 
since he's going to formulate different questions that are going to make him evolve very rapidly. Is it enough to think this in this way? You can see that there is something that does not fit very well, because if we do things in this way, we could double ourselves indefinitely, which means that the one that has doubled himself in time can double himself again in the same way, and this would give way to a system of doubling that could go to the infinite. But this is not our interest. Our interest is in having the sensation always of an extreme freedom, which means that someone that would be doubled from someone that does not know that is doubled would have the sensation of living alone in his own time with ideas that creates by himself. When one does not know this lay of doubling, we tend to function in this way and think that we are totally in charge of our thoughts, that we live in a unique time and it is our brain that creates our thoughts. It never comes to us that our thoughts could be created by someone else in another time. But if, if I double myself and I have a double in somewhere else, the questions of my double are also my questions. My double makes a question to me, which is me, and through this mechanism of exchange of information between any double and me, I can receive informations that do not come from my own double, in which case I would depend on someone that I do not know. So, I need to understand this principle in order to understand how it works in my own life and be certain that I only receive information that is really made for me. To explain it more simply, imagine that you call your husband on the phone who is, went to the jungle for 10 years. You call him to find out how things are going, to stay in touch with him, so he, to see if he can help you. Which means there is an exchange of information that is useful for both of you. Now imagine that someone else takes the telephone of your husband and answer in his place. And they start to tell you any other thing, any silly thing, while you think that it is your husband. Whatever they tell you is going to take you to live different things that your husband would probably not take you to live. It is exactly the same thing with the history of the doubling of time. If I have a double, I have to listen to him because it is also me. And it allows me to have a privileged relationship with myself because there is a me that is essential. But anyone can use this mechanism of exchange of information between one me and another me and end up receiving information that is not truly made for me. So how can I be aware of the difference? You need to know how the scientific law works in your life instead of inventing techniques. Because in France and in Spain there are so many people that are dedicated to talk about the doubling of time as if it was a technique. There is no technique, there is a law. And when you know the scientific law, you are capable of teaching people to not commit this mistake. Because you know the scientific foundation that is behind it, when there are people that ignore everything about science and turn it into a simple technique, they enter into the realm of the esoteric and connect it with things that can mislead people into misjudgment and that can parasite people with falsities. So you have to be very, very careful with this because there are many, many people that speak about the doubling of time without barely knowing anything about it. You cannot speak about scientific things without ignoring the scientific basis. We have to be careful not to use this vital law against ourselves. You said in your question, if I can create potential futures through my thoughts. Yes, I can. In the very instant in which I'm thinking something, I'm giving energy to it in another world, in another time where the consequences of my thoughts are created. I extract the synthesis of my thoughts as an answer, and it makes the loss of energy dedicated to what I have asked for in my thought corresponding also with a, with a gaining of energy, which means what I'm going to receive for that potential, and all of it in a zero time. It's wonderful. 
and I'm not aware of it. I have no awareness that I am even doing this. On another side, on a scientific level, there is a balance of energy that is related to Heisenberg's principle, a zero time of infinite energy, which means that I can always benefit from an infinite energy in a zero time. I have this possibility. The only question is how can I do to change the perception that I have of time. But there is a whole scientific law behind this that you need to know. You cannot just improvise upon it. This is precisely the goal of what I try to teach to people, not filling up their heads with scientific facts that are good for nothing, but behind everything that I teach, there is a logic that I follow. There is a scientific theory that you cannot ignore. It is absolutely necessary to stay within the logic of the scientific theory. The, all, the ancient Greeks already knew this, something that I have managed to demonstrate, that the Greek alphabet has an exact correspondence with the way in which we count the acceleration of movement in the doubling of time. From 1 to 10, from 100 to 10, I have even found the three lost letters of the Greek alphabet related to the movement of the doubling of time, because I needed 27 points for the steps that the particles draw in the Greek letters, and there are only 24 letters. So I've managed to find the three that were missing, and discovering this enabled me to see that the Greek was the basis of some pedagogy re related to the, with the doubling of time. I also saw that the words are, are made in concordance with the doubling of time. I even rediscovered the word onomaturge, which means word maker, which means that there was a profession of being a word maker in concordance with this doubling of time, which means that the ancient Greeks already knew something, and what they knew is that the law is the law of logic, logos. Everything that was illogical was outside of the law. If someone thought that something was illogical, it was considered by everyone as something that was outside the law, because it suppressed all the postulates and all the dogmas. If I have a dogma or a postulate that seems illogical to me, I have to consider it outside of the law. This is something that comes from very back, and the Greek have invented for this a school called the Sophists, which means Sophism in Greek is an attempt to demonstrate that even that which is logical can be illogical at the same time, and that if you arrive at an illogical conclusion through a, logic, through a logical thinking, then you should eliminate that way of thinking. There is this famous Sophism that everyone knows. A cheap horse is weird. Everything that is weird is expensive, so a cheap horse is expensive, you see? It is totally illogical, which means that the elimination of this way of thinking is difficult because it is perfectly logical. So we see that through a logical reasoning we can reach to something totally illogical. So I have to refute this way of thinking because the conclusion is illogical. If the way of thinking is illogical and the conclusion is logical, I have to refuse it. And if I consider it to be logical and you consider it to be illogical, I also have to refuse it because my way of thinking will not have convinced you. It is illogical for you, which means that it also has to be illogical for me and that I need to understand why your logic does not correspond with mine. So you see that all of this was very well known way before Jesus Christ, but it has been totally forgotten. Nowadays, all kinds of illogical things are, are being imposed. Many things, dogmas and, and illogical postulates have been invented that are presented to us as logical. It is obvious that our society lives in an absolute absence of logic. The world crisis of which everyone speaks, it is not that it is a crisis, it is just that we don't get to understand the purpose of being here on earth. From the moment in which we don't all know what the purpose of being is here on earth is, we do all kind of foolish things, which means that we need to understand what the purpose is of being here. It is only then that we would see that there is no crisis if everyone understands the purpose. 
But do people really want to get this purpose? Do they really carry the desire to reach that goal? That's something else. Because the fact that different times exist at the same time imposes a fundamental idea that the world in which I live is a world that I perceive and know very well, of which I think that it is unique just because I ignore this theme of this doubling of time. I ignore, for instance, that in the universe, almost everything in the universe is unperceivable. The fact that the universe that we see, that everything that we see represents only 5% of everything that exists. The 95% that we don't see, we know that it exists because there is force relationships between the observable and the unobservable. We call it dark energy, dark matter, but we don't know where we can find it and why. Precisely because we did not truly understand what is time. And we think that time is just the continuum of time that is totally demonstrated and proven by science and we don't see that what we call time is a simple sequence of moments. It's something that we can see in medical imagery, that our brain only captures certain moments. And we have the sensation of movement, when in fact it's like in a movie, where we have a certain number of images per second, but there is always empty gaps. There is only subliminal images that we do not perceive, like there are also subliminal times that we do not perceive. What good are they for? It is here where we need to understand this property of time that imposes on us the idea of a time that has properties, in the same way that we know that space has properties, and we know those properties because it is, it is our own space of observation. But we need to consider that with time it happens exactly the same. It has properties and it, we need to know them. The most simple of those properties is that in a time that does not exist for me, I create a certain potential and that is something extraordinary. That in the instant in which I think, I know that I'm creating the consequences of my own thought and that this consequence can be lived out by anyone. So it's something that I should know in order to be able to live with it in balance. I think I have answered several questions at the same time. Correct. Regarding the thoughts, Mr. Uh, Garnier, if we know that it's our thoughts that determine our reality because they carry mass, but we also know that we are influenced by the collective unconscious and our biogenetic inherent, what choice do I have in what I choose to think? There is a lot of confusion with the words that you use the collective unconscious, what does it mean? It means living in ignorance of the law. There is no such thing as a collective unconscious. What there is, is times that we do not perceive and modify our memory. But we can have access to those times that we do not perceive. The question is to know, how can we access them? The words subconscious and unconscious mean that we don't know how it works. But see something, if I imagine that there are unperceivable times in my perception of time that allow me to change the time that I have available for, then I have to admit that my life continues. But in a time that does not exist for another reality, and in that another reality there are unperceivable times, just as me. And in those unperceivable times they can receive information of my continuum of time. You see, this is like a matching different times. We, you need to understand very well how it works and not invent many, many things because it is this how people invent sub unconscious, subconscious and all of those things. The law is very simple. If I think in something, I create the consequence of my thought. And this consequence is a potential reality. And anyone on earth can catch that potential. In which sense catch? Their memory changes, and changes in regard to the thought that I have created, and they start living out the consequence of my thought, and I am responsible for that. 
So you see that the scientific law that is behind and that has been taught for centuries and centuries has been totally forgotten over time. I should think in doing to others what I would like others to think in doing to me. This is a law, and that is, if everyone would do the same, that would enable us to have a good life. But nobody knows anymore that this is a scientific law. This very simple law has been transformed, and I repeat you, it's totally scientific, into a lay that is absolute. Don't do to your neighbor what you don't want your neighbor to do to you. If you do something to someone, this already implies on one side that you are actualizing a potential that has been created previously and everyone can see what you're doing. Whether it is something good or bad, everyone can see it. Whether they imitate you or not, that's something else. But everyone knows that this is good or this is bad. Now, what good is that for? Instead, when you think of doing something, nobody can see that. But you are creating the corresponding potential that exists in everyone's memory and that can modify the memory of humanity. A single thought can modify humanity. You become aware how important it is to know the scientific law that is behind. Because nobody is saying it in an absolute logical and clear way. You need logic. And this is the goal of these trainings because everything that I say is grounded on this logic. The people that come to the courses that have done all kind of research and those that have done no research at all, it's necessary that when they are all there together, everything that they hear seems logical to them in their ears. And I managed to do that. You speak about a state of benevolence. What do you mean with that? If, like I said before, the scientific law consists of thinking of doing to others what I would like others thinking of doing to me, we can say that this is benevolence, meaning that I control the benevolence of my thoughts. Now, why use the word benevolence? Because people are carried towards speaking about love, affection, friendship, it is not an energy. An energy is an attempt to control the thought, which means that the word benevolence simply goes very well with it. You, it's necessary to know something. I see that in my trainings where many psychologists and psychiatrists come to try to understand precisely what that unconscious and that subconscious is, things of which they have managed to draw certain conclusions. It is very extraordinary to move forward with people who already have this knowledge of the spirit that now will be able to back it up with the law that is absolute and represents a possibility for humanity to progress at an extraordinary level. But obviously, you need to work with competent people that go much further because of their previous knowledge. You put something that is logical upon something that wasn't logical before, something they only had an intuition about, without knowing why nor how. So that's why I was said earlier, the subconscious and the unconscious are words that are actually hiding the absence of the law. But when you have the doubling of time, there are no longer subconscious nor unconscious. There are only perceivable and unperceivable times. In my perceivable time, I have the sensation of having conscious thoughts. But in the unperceivable times, I have the same thoughts, only I do not perceive them. I have no time to perceive them, and yet, through the doubling of time, I do perceive them. So you see, this is precisely where the interest of, of knowing this law resides and being able to, as, to associate with it the knowledge of psychology, psychoanalysis and others. They become very important because we found the logic behind them, the simple and straight logic.
Everybody understands in French and in Spanish that the word benevolent simply means to try to do the good, to watch over our well-being, which means that I know that my thought, if anyone could read my mind, assuming that it is my own mind that creates the thoughts, if everyone could see what I'm thinking and everyone could see that it is all right, then you could say that I'm benevolent. But it is not a state of mind. It is a control of my own thoughts because I'm not naturally benevolent. Which means that benevolence does not mean anything at prior. If I think of someone, for example of you, and I say myself, if she could read my thoughts, would she see everything is okay? Would she be happy with my thoughts? If I can answer yes, that she is happy with my thoughts, then I'm benevolent. Which means that everything that I think creates a future that you can harvest in your life. I plant something in the future and you harvest it. So we need to be careful. In French and in Spanish we have a proverb that says that the one who plants winds will harvest storms. So let's try to plant tranquility, calm and peace and then we will be able to harvest peace, calm and tranquility. So you see that thinking in doing to others what we would like others to think of doing to us is truly a scientific law. I think we can conclude with this because this is truly the most important of all. To see all of those scientists that have talked to us about this along the centuries, the first to talk about this was Pythagoras, a very well-known person. The second one was Buddha, more or less one and a half centuries after. And then we have Jesus about 2,000 years ago. Ago, and then Mohammed uh, seven centuries later. They all told us, all of them, think of doing to your brother what you would like your brother to do to you. It is a scientific law. We have laws, designs, we have turned it into many other things, into philosophies, into religions, into dogmas, etc. But it is not like that. We need to apply a law. And we need to know that law before we can apply it. It is not acceptable to invent uh, techniques without knowing the law and its applications. There is no technique, there is only a law. I hope to have been simple enough to show you that it is not the equations that matter, but truly that it is the application of a law, and that we are that law. I thank you very much for your welcoming. Thanks very much to you for your time and for your knowing. Thank you.